Will you please welcome <laughs> Dr. Michelle Maloney. Thank you so much. And um, I do feel like it's a very hard act to follow with these amazing guys and their discussions and their culture and the work that they're doing. So please um, bear with me as I change gear a little bit. But obviously I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional elders and the people in the country upon which we're meeting. You'll have to forgive me because I'm not just a Queenslander. I'm a lawyer as well. I, mean, I don't really have a lot going for me. Thank God I'm not an American or something. But anyway, um, so what I'll do, and I'll try to be quick because I think it'd be lovely to have discussions. I'm sure that's what the plan was. Um, I'm just going to share with you some of the work that we do as a bunch of non-Indigenous white lawyers who are from the European descendant pathway, looking back and talking back at the flaws in our own legal system and some of the work that we've been doing. Hello, gorgeous. Um, actually rethinking the systems and trying to work out how we push back at the bad stuff and how we work with others to build something better for a better future. Um, so very quickly, um, I'll just very briefly mention the ecological crisis because I'm sure this whole conference is, is full of experts on these things and I won't speak to it much, but it's just a reminder about some of the responses around the globe and some of the things that even good old crappy lawyers who are trailing behind the system <laughs> always um, are actually thinking about as well. <coughs> um, AILA is a really odd little group or an unfunded group started by a group of lawyers who really are deeply, deeply worried about the role of Western civilization in building the crisis, the destruction, the colonization that we've done. We're interested in changing the culture of European descendant style communities to help people think about where they live and what they're doing. Um, and to us, it's one of the keys to actually thinking about changing the underpinning governance structures of modern whitefella society. Because although um, a lot of things have been done under environmental laws and in certain kinds of efforts around this continent, the level of ecological destruction, as we know, continues. And we can either keep going with the small piecemeal attempts within a very flawed private property legal system, or we can rethink the whole shebang. And we have to do that in the context of a colonial nation that has never reconciled itself with its hor the horrors of its past. Um, so all the work we do is with Indigenous friends and elders, and I'll talk a bit about some work I'm doing with um, an amazing woman. Sorry, I'm from Queensland, so I live in Brisbane, but I grew up in the bush in the middle of Queensland in Bark Holden. Um, but I work with some Indigenous elders in the Combu Mary, uh, clans, um, including Mary Graham and some other folks from North Queensland. And I won't talk too much about this, but just to remind us, the stuff that the globalised society in the last couple of hundred years has created, it's quite the phenomenon. If you're writing a handbook on how to kill a planet as quickly as possible, if you place the beginning of the sort of so-called free fossil fuels as a point, where we didn't just create climate change, but other phenomenal levels of destruction, then you've got a pretty good guide to how to be planet killers. We're on our pathway, unfortunately. The big issue for many, many people from um, perhaps not so much in indigenous cultures, but certainly in other cultures, is how the heck do we undo the mess we've made? If you're a thinking and a caring human being who has been imported to this continent from somewhere else because you descend your ancestors did that, and you love this place with all of your beating heart and all the blood in your veins, how do you become a force for good? How do you, do, how do you become part of the solution and not the problem? And this is certainly the stuff that drives a lot of us slightly crazy and mad when we see the ongoing statistics of the death, the lack of water, our flying foxes dying off in the summers now, all these horrible things, the Great Barrier Reef. So in Queensland, we're getting pummeled by lots of bad news and then absolute insanity as the government allows things like the Adani mines, yes. despite everyone saying don't do it. And I mean everyone, including David Attenborough, so mm -hmm. whatever. So how do we undo this mess? The how do we get here? I won't talk too much to this, but sometimes when I do workshops for young um, European-style kids, I don't like white fella, I say white fella, black fella, so does Mary Graham, we stick with that, but I don't want to offend anybody. Um, when we tell youngins to think about the cultural background of the colonisers, you really have to remind them where we came from. The stuff that we're doing to the continent now and to the planet now is not new. We've been up to it for quite some time. And I will speak to this really quickly, but you know, writers like Derek Jensen say that from the moment um, the Middle East and Europeans, Middle East and Europeans started really broad-scale agriculture, we became destructive terraformers. 
Other people will point to European colonisation because we took a mode of thinking and being and working and operating and we carted it around the planet. And not only did we try to extract everything from them, we didn't keep that stuff there, we took it back to what they saw was the centre of the universe. So the European Industrial Revolution is obviously the starting point for the, for the downward slide for our poor old atmosphere. And there were a lot of people even shortly after large-scale um, steam and coal systems were being built could really see what was going to happen. But the one, oh, and I was going to say, a lot of young'uns think that it's kind of a system since the 80s, the rise of neoliberalism and a certain economic way of being. And that certainly kind of really sharpened the kind of private property commodification of the system that, you know, is driving this mad engine of extractivism and destruction. But a lot of people aren't aware of the simple statistics of what happened after the Second World War. And again, I'll just move through these things quickly, but if you've never seen this, this is some of the best evidence you can ever show climate deniers or people who don't care about the environment. I have two slides. One is impacts on the planet, and the other one is some of the causes. And what I'll just point out is, even though you can't see it, if you can see something like a dotted line on any of these images, there's a little line here. This represents 1950. And you can see some of these graphs say carbon dioxide, nitrous, <coughs> surface temps, marine fish capture, nitrogen into the coastal zone. After the Second World War, we had this perfect storm of technological capacity and a mindset, both from the Allies and particularly US corporations, that <coughs> said, we can do it, so let's do it. The, the ships got bigger, the fishing fleets got bigger, the capacity to take out forests got faster. Um, so the extractivism, and I'm not banging on about how nasty we all are, a lot of us are quite lovely, mm -hmm. but the extractivism in this mainstream culture, it's not something you're a crazy person standing on a soapbox talking about. The evidence is in. The extractivism of our culture and our economic system is a planet killer. And some of these other causes of it, look at the, the increase in large dams, the massive increase in water use, paper production, fertiliser consumption, energy use, population. The growth after the 1950s has gone crazy. And it's not indirect response to the population growth. It's actually a mode of thinking that North American Indian tribes refer to as Waitiko in their culture, which is almost like if people are trying to consume too much, it's a kind of disease or sickness, a mental illness. And I have some friends who are kind of looking into that and they argue that in some ways a globalised culture is kind of like some weird contagious disease. Mm -hmm. And that the good news is if we've got it, maybe we can get rid of it. Maybe we can cure this disease by looking to other times and cultures and ways of being and rearranging what we do. From the point of view of the work we do, it's called, we look, it's a simple theory and it's just, a, again, it's the white fellas talking back to our own system. Earth jurisprudence, this idea that we look to the earth and the biosphere and the living world as a guide for rearranging the systems. A simple way to think about industrial society is we have never managed for a very long time our relationships with the living world around us, which is what we heard about with the previous two speakers and many other folks, whether you're looking at language or healing or how we treat each other. Um, somewhere, something, something went really wrong. A young one once said to me, whatever we've been on, can we get off it? Yeah. And I said, I think we can. So, Thomas Berry, for those who are interested in kind of the writings of deep ecologists who are fascinating in their own right, um, but then who turn their mind to great work, he wrote this really cool book that helped influence us. And this also, I think, connects to the idea that when we focus on our own journey and our inner health and our mental health, and we know that there's a massive rise in mental health, loneliness, mm. obesity, eating disorders, all the kinds of things that other cultures didn't used to have, but in our culture, we're so disconnected from things that are real and lovely, we kind of lose our way. Thomas Berry was a, a deep ecologist who, in the latter parts of his career, turned his mind to the big systems, big governance structures. And it's actually this stuff that a bunch of us lawyers grabbed onto and went, this is really cool. It's a neat way to show people of um, European descent and a lot of white Aussies. We often forget that we have a culture. I know that sounds weird, but we forget, we look at other groups and think that they have culture and we're all neutral. And that's unfortunately typical of a dominant mindset. But if we rearrange things and look back at our own culture and where these systems have come from, 
Thomas Berry and many other people would say that over those many hundreds of years, thousands of years, the European mindset developed what he calls these underpinning structures of modern society. And they are all profoundly connected to anthropocentrism. So whether you look at law and government, economics, universities, or the dominant monotheistic religions, they all argued that we were separate from, better than, and more important than, everything else in the living world, including other people. So whether it, originally Christianity and other faith systems told folks that, that because of the colour of their skin they were worth more, and then they grabbed one of the coolest ideas ever, evolution, and turned that into social Darwinism too. So there's a whole lot of really weird thinking from my point of view when I look back at the ancest my ancestors and how they got us here, when, as the other gentleman said, they used to have a Stonehenge that actually did cool things and probably celebrated nature. Not sure where they lost their way. Um, but to get in there to, and I'm sorry that after being cool and dancing and thinking about oh, these amazing things, I've got to break down the legal system for you. <laughs> I'll try to make it vaguely interesting. Very, very quickly, and the whole point that I'm here to chat to you is to let you know that there's been some really, and I'm like 50 next year, so some pretty bloody amazing developments in, the, in pushing back the Western legal structure. Um, and it, a lot of us never expected to see this even in our lifetime, but if you think about current Western law, which is on the left, human laws are the highest authority. Think about it for a minute. Humanity makes its own shit up and then we follow it. Because <laughs> law is just a social construct, particularly in our system. It's not grounded in any particular truths. Human laws are the highest authority. Earth jurisprudence, and this is the cool thing that Thomas Berry did, he looked at m m more grounded cultures all around the world. And so there's a common story here. Successful cultures, happy cultures, build their systems around the living world, the regenerative nature of really what is an absolute bloody miracle, which is this complex biodiverse planet in the middle of an inky galaxy that so far we don't think there are any aliens. Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> So this legal system that the Western world has put together sees nature, anything other than a person and some other entities I'll talk about in a minute, as property. I really can't stress how weird that thinking is that everything other than us, and again in colonising times, even other people were property, but they have depicted the whole of the living world as a commodity for human use. The flip side is the urge from Earth jurisprudence and other cultures is to see the world as a living, interconnected Earth community, and it deserves much greater respect and much greater balance. But so to bring it back to the legal issues, what's really fascinating is this thing helps people unpack how ridiculous our legal system is. The best way to think about it is if you're walking down the street and there's bush over there and a town over there, what you see is a living world and a man-made structure and other human beings. If you put the Western legal system lenses over your eyes, you're going to see something really different. You're going to see the people, they're allowed to be diverse and alive, and you're going to see these big blobs and their corporations. Because in our legal system, the law respects the rights of incorporated entities, particularly the powers of corporations. But even if you're part of a sporting association or a small community group that's incorporated, our legal system recognises human beings and those entities as having rights. <coughs> and there's all these other little blobs. You're thinking to yourself, where do trees go? They're just blobs. Well, because they're human property. They don't have any legal rights. And in a nutshell, the legal rights movement, it's flawed, and I'll run you through some ideas and criticisms of where it's happening, but the legal rights movement is actually trying to directly speak back to Western law and put a different lens so that you'd suddenly go, hang on, this recognises that the entire living world should be a legal subject in the law, should have its own right to exist and thrive and evolve, and we should push down the powers and the structures of the non-living world like corporations, which are really just people coming together to pool their money. Mm -hmm. So this contrast between how the law is and how many <coughs> people are trying to push for it to be is a huge gap and I think there's a lot of work to be done. If climate change wasn't bearing down upon us and challenging the very way we live and breathe, we would probably be able to shift it in a couple of decades. <coughs> I've never seen such wonderful transformations in the last eight years. Um, but obviously we're under pressure and we're under time pressure. People like Cormac Cullinan who are in the sort of earth laws approach 
So that fundamentally changing the other uh, governance systems in the West will require much more than just reforming bits and pieces of law. And whilst we must hold our ground and we must support the existing wonderful environmental laws that have been tried in this country, they're not doing enough. They're simply not doing enough. We look at the whole world. One mum would say, ass about face. <laughs> we let the development happen and then we patch up the mistakes afterwards. So rights of nature laws, think about that lens. Rights of nature laws are the laws that try to change the legal status of the living world. And what we've seen around the world, for those who aren't familiar, at, when I first started with the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, there was just Ecuador and Bolivia. And that was, yeah, that was in, we were working, we started working on AILA in 2011. And then all these different things started to happen. People started to pick up on this. It's got, and I won't go into too much legal analysis, it will put you to sleep after all the wonderful spider power and emu dances we've done. Um, but in a nutshell, we've got um, several countries that have what we call blanket rights of nature laws that are trying to recognise the legal rights of nature across their whole jurisdiction. And in, since 2017, we've had this other branch of the rights of nature discussions, which is coming out of the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand, where Maori people, because they had a treaty with that, that side of the British government, have been able to try to argue under compensation agreements to get custodial responsibilities back. We've now got three ecosystems in New Zealand that all have their own legal rights. It's kind of fascinating for NRM folks, imagine this. So the Whanganui River, I'll talk about in a tick, but the Uruwera Forest is one of the simplest <coughs> examples. What they did was, under the compensation agreement, the iwi, or the tribe, or the peoples who were claiming it, um, that forest was a national park, and now it owns itself. So new legislation was brought in by the Western government, because we all know that all of the indigenous laws never went away, they're still there, but the Western government has even recognised this forest um, has custodial uh, peoples to look after it, and it's really been a compromise. What the lawyers and the Maori folk we've chatted to over there say, particularly with the first one, the Whanganui River, the Crown wouldn't give the river back to the people. The people wouldn't sign off on the compensation agreement, which even at its time had been the longest running court case in New Zealand to try to argue for fair compensation for the stealing of land. They wouldn't agree. And so someone suggested, why don't we help the river own itself? And then there's a guardian structure between the iwi and the government. So then the forest and then Taranaki Mountain. That in itself would have been quite remarkable, but very unique to New Zealand. <coughs> but then what we've seen is India, Colombia, Bangladesh, <coughs> and several other jurisdictions around the world have not just looked at it and kind of thought about it, they've expressly referred to the New Zealand example in their own court cases. And that means a lot, because these courts are looking to a completely different country for this cool idea, without any existing laws in their own country. I don't have time to explain how some of them work. There's a lot of detail, we've got a lot of slides. Um, there's, but the main thing, I guess, to perhaps leave you with is on rights of nature, and I just want to have two minutes to talk about... I've run out of time. No, no, go. It's OK. I'll have two minutes. I want to talk about the work I've been doing with Mary Graham, because um, she's a philosopher and an adjunct associate professor at UQ, um, about the future of law in this country and how we do it in a colonial state. How do we look at this honestly? and see what's the future look like. Um, but yeah, so to leave you with rights of nature, it's a happening thing. It's not perfect. There's a whole bunch of issues about implementation, who can speak for nature. But the biggest question, and one of the reasons Ayla has never been banging the drum for this approach, is that if you just go straight into some kind of rights of nature approach, you're slapping another Western-style law on top of the existing colonial structure and ignoring the existing ancient first laws. So it's a really interesting concept, but we have to think about how do we change <coughs> systems in their own cultural context and how do we work on those together to make a better future and to take away the worst sting out of Western laws and its treatment of nature. Um, I did have a lot of slides there, but it's far too many. Big questions in rights of nature is already what I said. Who can speak for it? How do you defend it? What kind of structures do the long-term planning and management and the most important thing in our countries is how do you interact with private property rights? Mm -hmm. Because just a gentle reminder, the entire English legal system and capitalism itself is built on private ownership. If you don't own it, you can't sell it. That's why neoliberalism went crazy in the 80s. They decided to commodify everything so you could sell even more, make more. 
There's a lot of criticisms, but I can talk about them another day. What fascinates me most, and particularly because of my love for Mary Graham as quite an amazing elder, but just an amazing human being who has the same questions as me. How do we live in this country into the future? How do we get along when we have different cultures and different systems? How do we push back the worst of the Western system, but not appropriate Indigenous law because that belongs to the Indigenous peoples of this land? That's Mary Graham talking at one of our events. So she's a philosopher um, and also what I would call one of the most amazing thinkers on different kinds of governance systems. And by governance, I just mean the rules and the systems that we live by as a collective. I give whole lectures on governance because I love it. I'm such a nerd. It's like, how, how do we play well together? And as Mary says, without killing each other off. I mean, that's why we're interested in governance structures, whether it's organisations, schools, how you organise your pizza distribution on a Friday night. It's all governance, baby. So, and I, please, I'm quoting from Mary Graham. I'm not trying to either appropriate knowledge or translate information. Mary and I are working on a book called Future Law how ancient and emerging ecological law can be a foundation for society in Australia. When's that coming out? <laughs> I haven't quite finished it yet, but I'm going to, we're working on it over the summer. We sit together and we talk and we write and we talk and we write and we're finding gaps in even our own communication that needs new words, and that's really interesting. And this is not about changing Aboriginal law, uh-uh. It's about letting Aboriginal law flourish, sovereignty recognised, all the good stuff, but pushing back at Western law. And in the last few minutes, I'll just show you what Mary says, and this is again Mary Graham, copy Mary people, not Michelle Maloney. Um, in Aboriginal law, the two most important kinds of relationships are between land and people, and those amongst the people themselves. And the first laws are the template for all relationships between people. First laws. And Anne Polina in the Kimberley talks about this widely as she talks about the threats coming to the Kimberley. And it's wonderful because she's bringing it into common white fellow lawyer terms. They're starting to connect with that. It's, God, it's fantastic. There's so much beautiful stuff that Mary Graham has read. If you ever get the chance to hear her speak at a, at a, like a standard conference, everyone's kind of blown away by her because her perspectives of things and her gentleness and insights are truly a gift. She talks about the custodial ethic locality, autonomy, balance, many other beautiful things, the separation of power and authority. Um, and she's got a great quote. She says in the West, you know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. She said if she had a version herself of Aboriginal people did, it would be, um, I am located, therefore I am. Uh -huh. And that's that whole yeah. connection to country. When she talks about the autonomy, and there's a whole bunch she talks about here, um, autonomous groups respecting each other's autonomy, long-term, stable, complex, phenomenal civilization when the white fellas turned up and did that. Yeah. It kind of went from <coughs> groovy, curvy lines to bioregional life to that. But anyway, I digress. The slide I wanted to get to is this one. This is really helpful for your average white fella because if Aboriginal people say that the land is the law and first laws are the template for our relationships with each other, and if Earth jurisprudence says exactly the same thing, that across all cultures that were successful, they used the Earth and the biosphere as the guide for life, then guess what? The Western legal system has no first laws. All of our laws are about people interacting with each other, You'll be thinking, hang on, what about property law? Well, let me just tell you about property law. It has nothing to do with property. It's nothing to do with the land or the stuff that you're talking about. It's the relationships between us. If you buy a block of land, the contracts, the legal process, never once says it has rich alluvial soils and an undulating terrain and a little creek and blue butterflies. It says you own it and it's a lease and you can do this with it, and it's worth that much money. So to me, and I'm really happy to leave it there, there's so much work we can do to be thinking about a different way into the future, and us whitefellow lawyers are doing our best to bang back at one of the most conservative, destructive, <coughs> slow-moving systems in white industrial society, the legal system. <laughs> We're also playing with economics, education, ethics, the arts, and a few other bits and bots. Earth-centered everything is what we talk about. But I think I'll leave you with that one because I think this notion that if we were to develop an earth-centered worldview and start pushing back at all the white fellow laws that are no good for that, 
we would have a different system. Um, and we've started to daydream about if we even just took white fellow communities into the land is the law and it's the template, what could we change and what could we improve? Thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it.